integrated pest management in the greenhouse. And the idea is to reduce the use of pesticides while still maintaining an acceptable level of, of con insect control. And this part right here, acceptable control, really, really, really depends on a concept that we call economic threshold. Different crops have different economic thresholds. And what this really refers to is what kind of uh, in contact you have for that plant. For instance, if we talk, talk about white flies, white fly threshold for poinsettias is considerably different than white fly threshold for greenhouse grown tomatoes. For instance, if you're selling the whole plant to a customer, they want that plant to come into their home and not be, not bring in insects that are going to flood around the house. But if you're growing tomatoes and you're only selling the fruit, and the fruit's going to be washed, we really don't care if the plant had white flies on it or not. So the thresholds are going to be very, very different. This threshold is aesthetically based. This threshold with tomatoes is going to be based upon um, production. So what we do is we look at this chart works on all pest management. Where we have time, we have insect or pest infestation level. And that pest could be a weed, could be an insect, mite, slug, disease. And the economic threshold is where we start to see um, some form of damage occurring to that crop. With tomatoes, greenhouse grown tomatoes, it's going to reduce the productivity of the plant. With uh, poinsettias, it's going to reduce the um, aesthetic quality, thus the ability to sell a plant. So once we hit this economic threshold, we start some sort of control. And here, we, it could be chemical control. It could be lots of different other practices. If we were to let this um, insect or pest infestation continue to climb without getting out of control, we're going to surpass economic injury level, and we're going to lose our crop. So we want to keep it with control to the right uh, side of the, tr the graph and when below the economic threshold. That's where we want to maintain our populations. Here's a, just a bigger image. So what are the steps uh, towards achieving integrated pest management in the greenhouse? And these are the, um, the seven steps I like to follow. Weed control, sanitation, inspection, exclusion, scouting, environmental conditions, and eradication as the last. And in fact, I like to recommend that people think about integrated pest management in this order. And integrated pest management is a very connected practice. You can't practice one part of integrated pest management and be successful. You have to include it all. You have to manage it. You have to use resistant cultivars. You have to de define what your cultural practices are. You need to learn how to be a scout, um, determine action steps, evaluation. And a good grower, a good greenhouse grower, does all of these things. First step is weed control. You cannot keep insects under control in your greenhouse if you do not manage the weeds in the greenhouse. What's the definition of a weed? What's the definition? A plant you don't want. A plant you don't want. That's all. That's good enough for me. Um, so what we need to do is we need to make sure that we keep the weeds from under the benches. We need to keep the weeds from growing in our crops if we're growing cut flowers. Now I know you've seen lots of weeds in a lot of different places. and um, Oftentimes, weeds are ignored because they're selling something else. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of people immediately say, what can I spray? Oh, I'm sorry. These are the only herbicides that are registered for greenhouse use. Glyphosate, Roundup. <coughs> Excuse me. 
<coughs> excuse me, it's always in pairs. Glyphosate, glufosinate, which is finale. These are broad spectrum herbicides. They kill uh, the plant. Um, they're hormone based. Um, diquat, paraquat is a burn back herbicide. Actually, the modern roundups that are selling now have a little dose of paraquat in them to give them a little boosted kill. If you go and buy the expensive uh, Roundup Plus, uh, they've added diquat to it, and then Envoy. Now, these um, herbicides <coughs> kill plants. As a consequence, they are not registered on the label for use in a greenhouse with plants. So you would use this when your greenhouse is empty. In fact, if you were with these first four herbicides, if you sprayed that in your greenhouse, especially Finale, and you happen to hit a hot water line, it will vaporize. And it'll kill all the plants for 25, square, 25 foot radius, including the plants that you are growing for your crop. So these are not registered for use in the greenhouse with plants. You can use them in the greenhouse, but the greenhouse is supposed to be empty. Okay. Pelargonic acid products, this is a product called Scythe. It's actually a uh, insecticidal soap, much like some of the soap uh, products. And it's a burn back product that is um, will burn the materials back to the ground. Most people, though, uh, also use weed barriers or landscape fabric under the crop. Paraquat, I will point out to you, has a high mammalian toxicity. I don't recommend its use. That's my personal feeling. Weed control, uh, some people can use uh, disinfectants for weed control. I mean, they'll help keep things clean. Um, you need to make sure that it's only quaternary ammonium compounds that have um, legal um, labels for uh, greenhouse and nursery use. Um, you could go out, you could go to the grocery store and buy a, a jug of bleach just as well as anything else, but is that a legal use of that product? The answer is no. It's not registered for greenhouse as a greenhouse pesticide. Quaternary ammonium salts, uh, these are disinfectants that are common in many industries, from the restaurant industry to uh, the hospital industry. These are uh, disinfectant compounds. Other things that people use uh, for weed control, some people will put fertilizer salts down. Probably one of the most common is hydrated limestone, um, which is uh, calcium hydroxide. And a lot of the greenhouses that we went through especially at Tagawa's, you notice that the floors were white. They have sprayed hydrated limestone. It goes by other names as quick lime, sweet lime, and it's an old product um, that we used to call whitewash, for those of you that are familiar with Tom Sawyer. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually a very good practice. It, uh, it, uh, it keeps the weeds from germinating because it's very alkaline. It uh, sanitizes the ground and also makes, uh, brightens up the floor a little bit and adds a little more light reflection. Um, mechanical weed control is probably the best. And what do you think I refer to? What do you think I'm referring to when I say mechanical weed control? Pulling it, getting on your hands and knees and pulling it. And where do you put the waste weeds? You don't put them in the ground, you don't leave them on the ground. And in fact, uh, my greenhouse staff at Perk. Our best way for taking care of weeds, and it's they fight over who gets to do it. Actually, is using a blowtorch, so <laughs> torching the weeds. Okay. One thing you need to also remember is the weeds outside are just as important as the weeds inside, because if you've got a high level of weed pressure outside of your greenhouse, that's going to harbor insects that are going to come into your greenhouse. So one of the best tools you can have as a grower is a lawnmower and keep the weeds cut back outside. 
also be very careful of using herbicides outside close to your vents. There are some herbicides that have high levels of drift and they'll volatilize and come into your greenhouse. Phenoxy herbicides specifically, they'll suck right into your greenhouse. Just because it's labeled for outside doesn't mean you can use it outside. So here's some examples of poor weed control. Here's a Snapdragon operation and they wonder why they have disease and insect pressure. They also have a dog that just kind of wanders all over the place, leaving uh, little trinkets. This is a greenhouse operation. They have their vent openings, and this is an interstate highway. So we've got all this land here. Do you think the interstate highway management team bothers to tell the greenhouse when they're going to spray Tordon? No. So you have to be aware of that. And this debris field outside the greenhouse, that just, small wonder this place isn't in business anymore. Yes? What's Tordon? Tordon. Tordon is a restricted use herbicide that a lot of people use in pasture management. Why it, would you grow, why would you say I'm not sure if they do or not. I just know that some states they do. So. But uh, roadside management, they use a lot of, uh, it's expensive to manage the roadside. I mean, so. So weed control is your first tool of integrated pest management. Sanitation. Best control is prevention of any type of uh, activity. How many people have washed their hands today? That's called prevention, okay? That's called sanitation. You've washed your hands to keep yourself healthy, right? Okay? You're also gonna sanitize your potting soil. You're gonna pasteurize it or treat it or make sure it's clean, okay? You're not gonna use dirty soil. Disinfect your benches and containers. Of course, you're supposed to use a registered disinfectant, bleach products, um, Damage chemicals. Da I mean, damage oxidizing chemicals like bleach damage tools. Okay. Traffic mats saturated with disinfectants. Wash disinfectant. Wash and disinfect hands and tools on a regular basis. Restrict employee access. Now, what does that mean? When we toured the greenhouses, did you? Who would you think? had the most risk of spreading a plant disease in any of the greenhouses? The employees? You? Or me? I'm the biggest risk. Why am I the biggest risk? Because I go everywhere. Okay? One of the things I do on a regular basis, if I go to greenhouses that have restricted entry, I wear shoe covers. And in fact, there's a greenhouse here in town that has restricted in entry because they grow certified disease-free potatoes, hops, and certified disease-free hops, and certified disease-free mint. Okay, they start with tissue culture plantlets. And when I go there, I, it's my first stop of the day. I make sure that everything I'm wearing has been to the laundry and the dryer and my shoes have been disinfected and I wear shoe covers because I'm the dangerous one. So some greenhouses, actually if they're propagation greenhouses, what they do is they have staff that only goes into different sections of the greenhouse and the staff should not pass between sites because if they're working in the final stages of production, there might be a disease infestation that won't impact the crop, but if they were to go to the great part of the greenhouse where they're just propagating new plants, there's a risk of contamination that could spread throughout the greenhouse. So often what a lot of these growers will do is their employees will wear color-coded badges, and if they have a color-coded badge that marks a color code on the door, they realize that they're able to go through that, and if they don't have the right color code, they don't go through that door, and it's for sanitation control, it's not because those people aren't trusted.
to wash their hands. One of the most important things to do, too, is to make sure you've washed your hands after eating or smoking, smoking anything. Because a lot of uh, tobacco products have diseases that can damage plants. So a lot of growers now just put a little hand sanitizer out um, so that when they walk in that greenhouse, they sanitize their hands. For those of you that have ever been in a hospital or been to see a physician, they do that walking in the door and walking out the door. This is a, a mat uh, that uh, this, emplo this uh, employee right here is walking through and it's got a little uh, puddle of disinfectant. And it's important that he walks through that and if we're, if we're running a cart through here, you'll notice that the width of this disinfectant pool is wide enough so it has at least one turn of the wheel on the cart that's being, going through the disinfectant. I've been to farms in uh, South America where you have to actually drive the whole vehicle through a disinfectant tank for fusarium control because they, don't have, they can't afford the pesticides to ship in to Colombia. Um, or South, any place in South America is cost too much money. So it's cheaper to do a disinfectant. So this sort of a disinfecting mat is really common. And in fact, Shannon Coleman's research will require this because of what we're doing in that greenhouse. Okay. So weed control, sanitation. Next part is inspection. Now, you're hoping that the plants that you received have been inspected by a certified plant inspector. In the state of Colorado, that inspection is done by the Colorado Department of Agriculture, and they inspect those greenhouses on a regular basis, and they put a certified seal on it for it to be delivered to another state. If that is in state commerce, within intrastate commerce, it's not required to be inspected. Now that just means that the inspector's been there and certifies they're using good practices. But you should monitor all incoming plant material because you don't want to bring in somebody else's problem into your greenhouse. Now of course in the springtime when we're bringing in cases and cases and cases of plugs and transplants, it's kind of hard to do. But ideally you should quarantine all new plants to make sure they're clean and eliminate all pet plants. What do I mean by a pet plant? How many of you own a pet plant? What is your pet plant? An it's an aloe vera and how long have you had it? <clears throat> About six months now. Six months, okay. So I have a plant that I just passed on to somebody. It's 45 years old. That's a pet plant. I passed it on to somebody who could take better care of it because I was afraid I was going to kill it. Pet plants. Oh, I, it's about to be fall. It's about to have a frost. I've got a buddy down the road that runs a greenhouse. I can take all my ferns off my front porch and he'll keep them for me. No, you will not. Pet plants are those plants that are in your greenhouse that have no point to be there and they have a tendency to collect diseases, viruses, and insects and stuff like that. Unless you're renting space to recover plants, this is not a business you want to do. So you want to make sure everything is quarantined and you inspect all plant material in your class, in your greenhouse. <coughs> all right, weed control, sanitation, inspection. Question. Um, when it was back in nursery production, there was somebody who I know is like, like he, one of their biggest customers or something. He re was renting space for them to like hold his lemon trees or something like that. So if he would have insects and caused problems for that entire greenhouse, that were bad like plants that he had to like pay to. Okay. Some companies, some greenhouses actually have a make a business to rent greenhouse space to bring plants in, and especially it's a major part of interior scaping to rotate plants in and out, and that's, that's a significant part of their business. With it comes a significant risk, but it's, it's an understanding of the customer and, that, and the understanding of the, the, the person providing the greenhouse space. Uh, I'm just giving you a general 
feel for what you should do. But for instance, interior scapers, some of the biggest interior scape companies, interior management companies, will rotate plants in and out of an, in, of an interior environment, rent, and they're just basically uh, providing a space for that plant, then rotating it out, and they're bringing it back in. It's going to have insects, it's going to have diseases, it's going to have, it's going to be under stress, and that's that is a different kind of business, but that is a different that is a business model that works. So the next part is insect exclusion. This is a, a greenhouse in uh, Southern California. Um, they are, are a propagator. And the, uh, this is their stock plant greenhouse. And you can see the crews uh, are wearing lab jackets. She's got a hairnet, uh, gloves, um, got a little mist bottle. Um, and uh, they're monitoring it. They've got uh, shade, but they've also got heavy duty screens excluding the insects. Sometimes if you just keep the greenhouse clean, you have less problems. If you've got a debris field outside your greenhouse, you're going to have problems. Um, other types of exclusion include trapping. This is um, a greenhouse tomato operation. They've got a track mounted uh, sprayer, but they've also got yellow material to trap the insects. Exclusion typically, though, refers to some sort of a screening system. When we put screen on the window, well, screen for a Japanese beetle is much different than screen for Western flower thrips. Japanese beetle, they won't, they're not going to make it through a quarter-inch hardware cloth, whereas a Western flower thrips has a fine, fine mesh. So you need to make sure that you size the screen surface to make sure that you can accommodate the airflow. Double doors with a uh, positive pressure. Uh, also helps to eliminate the problem. So here's a, a end of a greenhouse where we're mounting an insect thrip screen over the the cooling pads will go on the open part here and you notice the surface area is about five times maybe ten times the size of the pad surface area. But what this does is by excluding the insects cuts down the requirement for uh, a lot of pesticide use. So exclusion is a major part. Scouting. And that picture is really easy to see. <laughs> Scouting refers to looking at the plants. Scouting refers, the best scout is that person on the end of the water hose. And that's why you don't want to put your most unexperienced, unskilled grower on the water hose. You want to have somebody that knows how to look for plants, determine the levels of outbreak, and identify the pest in case you're going to use some kind of environmental control. We use sticky cards. Now sticky cards, some people think of them as a trap. They're not an effective trap. They're not an effective management tool. I've walked into greenhouses where these are black with insects. That's a waste of time. So you use the sticky card to monitor what's going on in your greenhouse, to monitor your outbreaks, to see what kinds of, of insects and, uh, that you're having come out. Anybody a fly fisherman in the room? Anybody do fly fishing? If you're fly fishing, what's the first thing you do? Just grab something out of the tackle box? No, you look to see what's hatching. Okay? Otherwise, you're not going to catch anything. So most cards are yellow. Um, Blue is specific for western flower thrips, if you want to just look for thrips. Um, I don't own a yellow shirt um, because I don't want to walk into a greenhouse and have me be the attractant. Um, this is an example in the lower corner uh, of this yellow strip. That is a trap. That's, they're using that as a trap. And oftentimes you'll see whole, all along the pad wall in a greenhouse where they'll use this for a trap. That's an effective trap. A little three by five card is not. So how do you do your scouting? It's important to be on a regular basis. Scout weekly. And use the same pattern. Check what pesticides are being used, if any. 
scan the crop. One of the first things I do is I look in the greenhouse and look across the crop to see if I see any individual plants that are different. Look at your sticky cards and look at the plants, but also scout weeds under the bench. In uh, some states, uh, scouting is a career, being a, a professional scout. Agro agronomic crops have used scouts for years where they go in and manage the crop. When you're scouting, it you helps the grower decide uh, pesticide selection, what chemical family, how it should be delivered, the application zone, where it should be used, and the scout should also document the life cycle stages because different life cycle stages of different pests are different of their susceptibility to um, any of the pesticides that we're going to use. Weed control, sanitation, ex inspection, exclusion, scouting. The next part is environmental control. We want to maintain our greenhouses at an opti optimum condition for growing our plants. Sometimes that optimum condition is, is optimum for an insect as well, but oftentimes not. Spider mites, for instance, which I know is not an insect, however, its optimal conditions is hot and dry, not cool and moist. So if you're letting your greenhouse get too hot, perhaps you're going to set yourself up for a spider mite outbreak. So look for uh, inadequate cooling or something like that to work with your optimum conditions. Eradication is the final step in integrated pest management. There are three sorts of practices that you can use in eradication. Removal of infested plant material, biological control, and pesticides. So sometimes the best thing to do if you have a heavily infested plant is just to remove it. My best treatment for mealybugs <coughs> on tropical foliage is to dump the plant because sometimes the cure is worse than the problem. So don't be afraid to pull out and rogue out the problem. It might be cheaper in the long run rather than paying an employee to mix up a suit up in, in personal protection equipment, buy, buy and mix up the pesticide, apply the pesticide and clean up the equipment. Depending on the amount of labor that that just cost you, it might be cheaper just to dump that plant or two if you can control the outbreak. Things like aphids, spider mites, mealybugs, uh, scale, those are often easier to control with eradication than applying a pesticide. Then there's biological control, then there are pesticides. So this slide is actually a little out of order. Should have been in part of environmental control. Insects and mites are cold-blooded, temperature-related, this is a spider mite, two-spotted spider mite. That's one of the commons that ones that we have. Um, and little eggs go along with him or her. Spider mite from 50 to 68 degrees, egg to adult in 28.2 days. 8.3 days at 77 to 95 degrees. So we don't typically see spider mite problems in cool greenhouses. You let our greenhouse get too warm, you're going to get run into problems. One month at 60 degrees, we get 20 mites from one female. One month at 70 degrees, 12,000 mites from one female. 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 13 million mites from one female. Question? Okay. Is there an upper threshold where the mites start dying? Unfortunately, an upper threshold is probably higher than what would kill the plants. 
Somebody else had a question? So, I think um, day degrees is a, is a concept, I'm not sure they're teaching this in entomology, where you can use, uh, the scouts will use the day degrees to determine the cycle of an insect or in mite infestation to time the application of a pesticide or a treatment. And day degrees is different than average daily temperature. The day degrees is set up by the entomologist and they use maximum and te minimum temperatures. And this can help you track your generation time. And the pest, most pests, the threshold is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you can use this tool to schedule a pesticide treatment. So for instance, knowing your insects is important. I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you can tell an aphid from a leaf miner. Um, but it's good to know how many day degrees it takes to, for it to complete its life cycle. And that way, a scout can help schedule and manage their insects. Sometimes you can get that crop in and out of the greenhouse under those um, limits so that you can um, manage your crop in a better way. OK. Some common insects that we use uh, that we see in the greenhouse. Aphids, fungus gnats, shore flies, bulb bites, mites, white flies, thrips, slugs, and snails. I know they're not insects or mites, but we deal with them here as well. 